afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for Internal Size Up Mental Health for EMS. This is a webinar that's a collaboration between the American Ambulance Association and the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance, our trusted mental health partner for our members and their employees. Uh, today, you'll be hearing from Jeff Dill. Jeff holds a master's degree and is a licensed counselor. He's a retired fire captain from the Chicago suburbs and is a member of the American Counseling Association and the National Board of Certified Counselors. Jeff is the proud founder of the FBHA. Um, the FBHA actually serves as the counselor match provider for the AAA. So if you've ever availed yourself of our counselor matching program, um, you probably spoke with Jeff or his staff. Um, as we advance to the next slide, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how you can interact directly with Jeff as well as with your fellow attendees during this broadcast. The chat box is the one that looks like a little uh, speech bubble at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to connect with your fellow attendees by sharing links to any resources that you may have developed that are helpful to you or asking questions of your fellow uh, EMS colleagues that are attending this session as um, regular attendees. If you'd like to connect with Jeff directly to ask questions of our expert, there's a Q&A function that, will, that looks like two chat bubbles on top of each other. If you click on that button, you'll be able to submit a question into the queue that just me, the moderator, and Jeff will be able to see. We'll try to answer those as we go. If we miss any during the meat of the presentation, we can also uh, take some questions at the end. So with that, it's my absolute pleasure to turn uh, today's presentation over to Jeff Dill. Thanks, Amanda. I, I appreciate it. Uh, and I'm honored here to be speaking today uh, in front of my brothers and sisters uh, from Branson, Missouri. And, and let me first start off, uh, please do not be fooled by the name Firefighter Behavior Health Alliance. Uh, I work uh, with all my brothers and sisters in fire, EMS, and dispatch. And uh, just a little something about myself, uh, like Amanda stated, I'm a retired fire captain. Uh, from the Northwest Burbs. I had 26 years on the job. I first started as a volunteer and then went career in 95 and retired in 2015, moved to Phoenix, lived there for four years, and now I live now here in Branson, Missouri. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed by the path that we are put on in life. And uh, I was just floating along as a battalion chief when Hurricane Katrina hit. And uh, Division One outside of Chicago sent down numerous firefighters, including a couple from our department. And when they came back, they said, man, Jeff, we were, we, we were picking up bodies in the streets and the devastation, destruction. It was horrific. And they went to counselors, good people, but they didn't understand the EMS and the fire world. So uh, they became frustrated and never went back and yet still struggled. So I decided to go back and get my master's degree and help out my brothers and sisters as a licensed counselor. And in 20, uh, 2009, I founded Counseling Services for Firefighters, and this is where I was training counselors and chaplains. You want to work with us, you need to understand us. We're a little different here in the EMS and, and, and fire dispatch world. When in 2010, I started receiving emails and phone calls from across the world saying, do you do anything about EMS and firefighter suicides? I said, I didn't know we had any issues. And so I started doing a lot of digging and found out that uh, there were no organizations that track and validate EMS and firefighter suicides. So FBHA was founded in 2010, and we are still the only organization that tracks all fire, meaning uh, wildland career, military, uh, volunteer, as well as EMS and dispatch suicides. And what that means is that uh, when you, hopefully you'll visit our webpage at FFF uh, or FFBHA.org, uh, we have a confidential reporting system and people submit uh, their losses, the tragic events. And when I receive them, I have no idea where they come from. The emails are scrubbed, but I then call the EMS departments or fire departments. And so we have validated 1,511 of these tragic events. And uh, I've personally spoken to about 1,465 chiefs uh, to hear, you know, the, the tragic events that they were dealing with in their lives as fire and EMS personnel. And uh, we collect the data, you know, we, we never use names. We never use organizations. That's just our, um, our confidential agreement that we have. 
and uh, we've learned a lot. And uh, so over these past 10 years, uh, I've traveled well over 100,000 air miles every year. It won't be this year <laughs> because of the virus. Uh, it's presenting to EMS organizations and fire department organizations, speaking at EMS conferences in regard to what we've seen and talking to thousands and thousands of our EMS and, and fire, uh, fire brothers and sisters. So within our workshops, we now have seven of them, about 99% of them come directly from you and the EMS personnel that were struggling and suffering with different issues. And so I'm just kind of the, the medium. I'm just bringing their message, uh, those that took their lives. I'm bringing their message from families. We do a lot for family members, uh, survivors. We have an annual weekend retreat. We have a closed Facebook group of family survivors that lean on each other and support each other. So we... Uh, you know, we, we truly enjoy it. Uh, like I said, we're all amazed in our lives by the paths uh, that we're put on. And uh, this is ours. And uh, we just try to bring that message to you today. So uh, that's just a, a little something about myself. Uh, today we'll be talking uh, internal size up. And, uh, you know, when I first started doing workshops in 2011, we had uh, two themes. And that was, you know, be direct and challenge with compassion. And an internal size up became uh, our third one. And uh, we'll talk about that as we go along. So today uh, we'll be looking at uh, cultural brainwashing. And uh, it's not a negative term, but we'll be talking about cultural brainwashing. Uh, we'll look at emotional awareness, uh, signs and symptoms, which is absolutely key. Uh, not a lot of training, I'm sure, that you haven't had in your uh, EMS careers, starting with an EMT. I started my EMT back in 1991, I think, and then a paramedic in 92. And uh, when I retired in 2015, all those licenses, uh, they lapsed. So that's just what happens when you retire, I guess. Uh, we'll talk about behavioral awareness. We'll, we'll talk especially about PTSD. And uh, when we get to that section, I'll explain uh, how we're going to approach that. Uh, we'll look at our data um, that we've uh, uh, that we have, and uh, it is used all over EMS and fire world, uh, media, uh, Congress. Uh, they they use our data because they know, you know, this is something very passionate for me, and it's it's as accurate as as an OCD person can get it. <laughs> so, and then uh, we'll talk quickly, real quickly, about retirement. So. Let's, uh, you know, like I said, uh, be direct and challenge with compassion were our first two thoughts when we started way back when doing workshops. And then we added internal size up. And, and I want you to really think about this, this internal size up. And what it means to me is that we need to ask ourselves on a daily basis, why am I acting this way? Why am I feeling this way? And one of the best things that you can do is listen to others because they see us a lot better than we will ever see ourselves. And in this cultural brainwashing, it comes about under the pretense that when you put your, your uniform on, this is how you're supposed to act as an EMS responder. Courageous, brave, uh, self-sacrificing, dedicated, and, uh, but don't show any weakness and because we don't want to get you know, mocked out or, or, or laughed at. And you're supposed to handle all issues on your own. And when you're challenged, both in your personal or professional life, that is darn difficult to do. And who expects this? Well, your brothers and sisters that you work with in the, in the EMS field, uh, the communities you serve, and just the traditions of being an EMT or a paramedic, uh, they dictate how we are supposed to act. And so it becomes very difficult to handle things on our own. And we'll talk about that as we get into uh, the addiction areas. So, but let's, uh, let's start off with, uh, you know, cultural brainwashing. I'm a firm believer we've all been culturally brainwashed at some aspect in our life. I'm a firm believer that I remember my first time I was culturally brainwashed. I was born and raised in Rochester, New York in 1961. I got a birthday coming up pretty soon. I'll be 59. Uh, but uh, I can remember we used to go up to the East Coast. You know, my folks, we didn't have a lot of money, my two sisters and myself, but we would go up to Boston and Maine and, and Cape Cod every summer, two or three times. And that's when at six years old in 1967, I can remember when I was first culturally brainwashed into this, the Boston Red Sox. 
man, oh man, we, you know, taking Red Sox games and I'm listening to him on the radio. And, uh, you know, I met Carl Yastrzemski a year later when he came out to Rochester, New York, and, and boy, the, the buy-in was there. This was it, culturally brainwashed. I'm walking around Rochester now, and, and damn Yankees are trying to win the pennant. And just think about maybe a sports team in your life or something in your life. It's amazing how that thought process becomes so easy for us. So every time you put your uniform on and respond in that box, that ambulance, guess what? You're culturally brainwashed into acting a certain way. And that, that becomes very, very difficult to, to handle. And I look back and I think, well, you know, who did this? You know, who, who culturally brainwashed? Well, you know what? There they are. There's my folks. You know, they're, they're, still, they're still living in Rochester, New York. My dad's 86. My mom's 82. Uh, they, they attended a Red Sox game uh, last year in the, up in Toronto. And they sent me this picture. And, and what do you think my first thought was? Hey, why are you standing next to a Blue Jays? mascot you know and then i started realizing oh my god what a great picture you know my folks are getting out like i said our thought processes are easily taken over when we start talking about cultural brainwashing and how you're supposed to act as an emt and a paramedic so where did all this begin well uh, i believe the cultural brainwashing began you know and and, and it starts the stigma of asking for help uh, you know Counselors knowing the job. How important is that to have a counselor understand? I have some great friends that are counselors. Do you think I would have sent any of my EMS and my, my firefighter brothers and sisters to a counselor that didn't understand what we do? No, and this is why it's so important that the American Ambulance Association has teamed up with FBHA so I can find you culturally competent counselors that will work with you, that you feel comfortable in. And uh, believe me, I, I, I've seen some. I worked with you know EMS personnel before I re retired as a counselor, and, and I had you know one one uh, paramedic told me that their counselor passed out in front of them when he started talking about some of the calls that were really bothering him. So it's absolutely important to have uh, that list, and uh, we have a list. Uh, the FBHA and the National Volunteer Fire Council. We just uh, released a list of about 170 counselors across the United States that I have personally vetted. So I've been making a lot of phone calls due to the virus. Uh, how about supervisors, uh, EMS members, the lack of training in communications and behavioral health? You know, when I, when I contact an EMS chief or supervisor, and the one thing that they tell me is, well, you know, we didn't know our, our member was struggling. Well, and I, I will say, well, how would you? If you haven't had the training in regard to behavioral health, how would you ever recognize these things? And that's why it's so important not to really condemn uh, supervisors. Now, there's a difference between not knowing and being ignorant to a situation. I mean, I, I know that very, very uh, closely working with my EMS brothers and sisters. Many organizations don't want to put any emphasis into behavioral health and maybe their insurances aren't up to what I believe are standard for getting you resources and benefits. Uh, you know, lack of access to counseling services. I know there are rural EMS organizations out there that are way out there in, in where there's not a lot of opportunities. And, and that's why I think one of the benefits, and there's not many <laughs> the virus, but one of the benefits has been the introduction of the telehealth services, where now uh, EMS members can sit in their house and talk to a culturally competent counselor from their, from their den and have these sessions. And it makes it a lot easier than anyone in your state. They, they could be you know, 400 miles away, and, but you still can hold your session. And so that's important, and we've, we've learned that, and you'll find that in our list. And if you call us for help, I will find you a counselor, and they might not be in your area. They might be across your state. And then, of course, the adrenaline junkies, and this is an, an issue. This, um, you know, these are our brothers and sisters that really look forward to uh, going to the job. In fact, they hold maybe two jobs, maybe even three, and the thought is, is well, when do you ever let this relax? You know, when do you let your mind just walk away? And self-care is so important, to, you know, and that adrenaline rush. And unfortunately, it, it carries it with you even after you retire, even if you're on disability and things. So, you know, these are some of the things that we address uh, when we talk about cultural brainwashing. And uh, this is where I believe it all started in our EMS and paramedic classes. 
you know, they, they taught us so much, right? If you, if you think back, and I have to think back way back, you know, the, the things that they taught us were, you know, of course, PPE, scene safety, right? Uh, they talked about airway and breathing and circulation. They, they trained you on all these type of things, uh, vital signs. You got you to gotta know the vital signs and, and how do you help people. Uh, they talked about IVs and intubations and, and interosseous and, and all these wonderful things, right? Uh, how, how about uh, cardiac and, and meds? They, they trained you so that when you go out there to the public, you're helping them, you feel competent and very confident in your abilities. And yet, what were we missing? And even today, where it's very, very... Uh, laxed on trying to train anyone on behavioral health. I would have loved to see my first day in my EMT class when the instructor back in 1991 come in and say, welcome class. Uh, today we're going to talk about stress and anxiety because most of you will suffer that in your career. And then we're going to talk about um, uh, addictions and depression. Depression, right? And you know, we're going to talk about the highs and lows that you're going to go through because of what you're going to see and do and how many of us will turn to addictions to offset the highs and lows that you're going to see. We'll talk about post-traumatic stress and the images you'll carry in your mind for the rest of your lives. Uh, we'll talk about um, suicidal ideations. Well, in fact, in this academy today, we might almost, may even lose someone. Uh, because of this, this job. And I hope you had a great night's sleep last night. It's probably the last one you'll ever have in your life. What would they have done to that instructor back in 1991? You're gone. Why? Because that's a negative. That's a negative against the perception of what the community sees you as EMS service members. To come there, help, respond, rescue, save lives. And you know, these are the struggles that we have for our brothers and sisters. And if we don't start making those changes, especially within our schools, then what will our numbers be five, 10 years from now? And these things are important to understanding that cultural brainwashing, it incorporates you know, the, the mental health aspect of what we do out on the streets. So how about stress and anxiety? Whew. How many of us have any type of anxiety? Here, you know, and, uh, it, and it happens. I do a lot of surveys, whether in face-to-face -face or on SurveyMonkey. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that here in below uh, in a second. But anxiety disorders can include anything like panic disorders. Have you ever seen someone with a panic disorder? Wow, you, you pull in there on the scene, you, you think, man, I, I better get the monitor ready and uh, the meds ready. This one's having the big one. And panic disorders, who they, they are very, very difficult to, to deal with when you start to talk about anxiety and stress. How about OCD? How many of you out there believe that you have some type of OCD based on what you do? I do. I absolutely do. Because we're so regimented. This is how we do it. We have to do it this way, this way, this way. And, and you carry that in your life. There's no doubt about it. And... Uh, how about, you know, we'll talk about PTSD coming up. We have a whole section for that. So, like I said, I, I did a survey, and within a week, I received 942 responses. This is both fire and EMS. And out of those 942 responses, 71% of them said that they deal with stress and anxiety on a daily basis. That number just blew me away. I'm thinking that hey, it might be about 40, 45%, 71.43. And things that they were struggling with, of course, sleep deprivation, uh, promotional issues, uh, the shift work, emergency incidents, family issues. Whew, how important is family? We'll talk about that when we look at our data. Uh, financial issues, you know, uh, union or management issues, association, and then retirement, and then, of course, injury or death of a brother and sister. This is what they deal with. Guess what? This is our life right here in, in the EMS world, right? These are what we deal with on a daily basis. Now you add COVID-19. Holy, that, that number, I'm sure, would skyrocket from 71 to maybe close to 90%. And so these are the issues that we're dealing with. 
uh, the response is, you know, they came back to, well, you know, try to avoid caffeine, alcohol. We know this. I'm not going to spend too much time on this aspect. Uh, physical activity, absolutely important. I walk uh, about two and a half miles every day. I listen to my country music. And, uh, and believe me, in some of the hills in Branson, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a test for an old guy like myself. But, you know, having that physical activity absolutely does help. Uh, sleep, you know, one thing I did is I took a TV out of our bedroom. You know, it's just it's such a, a stimulant. How about our phones? Is there like a time limit? Maybe 30 minutes before you go to bed, you put your computer down and your phone. These are all things that uh, they were practicing and working on. Uh, relaxation techniques, train your brain to think about words, calm and peace. A lot of times I think about uh, when I was growing up and, uh, you know, I had a, a great um, um, growing up period in my life with my sisters in, in Rochester, New York. And I think a lot about that, that time period. And it makes me relax. How about just talking to someone regarding your stress? Talk. You know, everyone's heard the word resiliency, right? Oh, resiliency. How are we resilient? To me, resiliency starts with talk. Talk, talk, talk. Get those things off your mind and uh, whatever is bothering you. Keep a, di a, a, a diary. You know, when I was a counselor and I would have you know, paramedics and firefighters I would say, hey, I want you to you know, keep a diary. And, and I don't mean you know, the little book with the flowers and a little lock on it like my sisters had. I'm talking about just a piece of paper. And at the end of the night, write down what emotions you went through and what were your reactions through those emotions. And then bring it back after a week and we'll talk about it. Because when you talk to people, it's very easy to BS people. You know, we're very good at that in the first responder world. But when you sit alone at night and you start writing from your heart, you cannot BS that. And so, you know, write a little diary. And what events caused it your stress and what were your reactions? Uh, take control. Take control of your life. We do a great job of on the scene, right? We come in, there's a full arrest. You know, hey, let's you know, interact. Let's put in airway. This and this. Keep, a, keep people back. We're taking control of that event. Now I'm asking you to take control of your life. Get involved in your life. Uh, manage your time procrastination, that adds a lot of stress and anxiety. And the one thing that I can truly say is that us in the first responder world, we have to learn how to say no. We cannot be everything to everyone. As much as we want to, that's ingrained in us. That's what we want to do is, is help others. But we need to learn how to say no. It's important. It's vital for our own stress reduction. Uh, you know, some of the negative stress coping mechanisms that they were, they turned to these 71% uh, were, of course, drugs, pain medicines, alcohol, uh, smoking, and of course, eating. And then lack of communication. This is where we have the issue with relationships. We take things, we see things on a job, and we, we take it home. And when I look at the data, and I always go back to my data, because it's accurate, it's spot on from right from the, you know, the chiefs or the family members. The number one known reason for EMS taking their lives, unknown is number one, all right? But the number one known reason is marital and family relationships. And where do you think communications falls involved? Right then and there. Why are we acting this way? We take it home. And I love it when paramedics or EMS people tell me, no, I leave things at the job. Yeah, sure you do. Let me go ask your family member about that one. We take it home. And communications or lack of is one of the essential issues that we need to deal with. You know, some of our recommendations that we always talk about, and like I said, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in counselors. You just got to have some type of, of counseling. And, and counseling doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to a professional. Maybe you go to a chaplain. Maybe you just talk to a brother and sister. You know, but, but find that counselor that will help guide you. And that's what they do. That's what we do as counselors. We help guide you. And if one that you go, you're going with or one or two that does not work with you, let's find you another one, okay? You know, consider a support group. I know a lot of medics and EMS and firefighters that have started a support group in their areas. They, they call maybe a church or something and say, hey, can we borrow a room on a, on a Tuesday night from 7 to 9 so that people can come down there and just talk and support each other? Why do you think we have uh, on our Facebook group, we have a support uh, a closed support group of family members, family survivors. They talk to each other. They lean on each other. They've been through those experiences. I've never lost anyone. 
personally in my family or you know my friends growing up to the, to those that killed themselves i've sat on a job and i've seen it a lot now and there's no doubt about it but I can't get into those groups and speak about it because I never lost a loved one thing. So that's why, you know, consider a support group, uh, relaxation techniques that we talked about talking with family members, explaining how they can be helpful. Uh, therapists, please follow through with whatever your counselor says. It might not look like it, it's being advantageous at the time, but, uh, uh, they do know their stuff. And of course, regular exercise. Let's talk about anger real quick. Anger is in our top five warning signs. And uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but I, I can speak from anger. Um, this is one I've had to deal with. And I, sh I should say, this is one my wife <laughs> has had to deal with. And it's amazing about anger, how quick it, it can erupt. Uh, a few years after I retired, uh, one of the trade magazines asked me to write an article and uh, they said, pick your to topic. And so I titled it, why do you act so angry, a self-reflection? And you can Google it if you want. And, and I can remember it was a, in December, uh, two years after I retired, and I sat down at the kitchen table on a Sunday morning, and I started typing away, 900 words or so they needed. And my, my bride, who will be celebrating 40 years this year in November, she, she came in and she asked me a question. And, and this was my reaction to it. I pointed to my computer, then I looked at her and I pointed back. And, and I tell you, it did not go over so well, not at all. And, and I started thinking, well, why that reaction? Is this the article that's going to change the, the fire service and the EMS world in the American culture? I don't think so. But at doing that internal size up, which I absolutely believe, I realized really quickly why I acted that way. I was on task. And 26 years of being on task, it, it becomes you. Have you ever, in the EMS world, have you ever come in on a cardiac arrest and the family members are standing around there while you're trying to do intubation or IVs and things? Do you like them when they're standing right over you? No, you just stay back, stay back. You're focused, you're on task. When you got the first one there on that vehicle accident and you have to get in there and, and help maintain the spine and, and all these things, starting IVs while they're trying to extricate. Did you like it if witnesses and you know, stand, you know, people standing by or leaning against the car and getting in your way. No, stay back, stay back. We're focused on task. Have you ever been watching TV when a loved one says to you, did you even hear what I had to say? Probably not. We were focusing on task. It's, it's not an excuse, but it's an understanding. And we're very good at it, you know, staying on task. And, and this, this anger that builds is amazing from the things that we see and do. One thing that uh, we have found very quickly is, um, is a term here um, that I, I talk a lot about, and that is cognitive disconnect. Out of the 1,511 that we have validated, uh, approximately 60 of our brothers and sisters were murder-suicides. And uh, very, very difficult, where they killed their loved ones and then themselves. And... I firmly believe there's this cognitive disconnect. And what is that? To me, it's when your emotions overrun reality and you base decisions on those emotions of either anger, jealousy, you know, whatever that emotion is. And, and that's a problem. Guilt, how powerful is guilt? Very powerful. And you know, so this, this example I always give is that here you are, you're a paramedic. You wear your uniform, you go to the store and, and, and people, oh, thank you for what you do. You're heroic. You're, you're helping through the COVID-19 in our community. You have a parade and you got your ambulance and you're throwing out, you know, candy and maybe you got a water pistol and everyone loves you. And then you go home to the one who knows you the best and they don't put you on that pedestal. And then maybe in the heat of an argument, this cognitive disconnect comes into play why can't you treat me like John Q. Public does? And in the heat of that argument, they pull out a gun or whatever it is, and they shoot their loved ones and then themselves. And, and these are things that we need to watch out for, that anger. And that's why it's so important to do that internal size up. Why am I acting this way? Why am I feeling this way? So please watch out for that. Now, 
a, a lot of things that we talk about uh, with depression and, and how, how difficult is depression. It requires a medical diagnosis as a counselor when someone says, hey, I think I'm struggling because it could be some type of hormonal issue going on through their body. So re it requires a medical diagnosis, but also understand what's ever out in America is within our EMS services. You know, whether it's OCD, whether it's depression, whatever is out there, you know. So as we go along here, these were some of the issues that these 41%, 41% said that they struggle with depression like symptoms on a daily basis. Depression is the number two known reason why our brothers and sisters in the EMS and fire service are taking their lives. And they were dealing with mood, mood issues, sleep issues. We know sleep is, is a problem. Whole body, behavioral, especially the excessive crying. Many in, in the survey that sent back said they were, would be watching a comedy show and all of a sudden they were, they were excessively crying and they didn't understand reasons why. And that's amazing, like I said, what the brain controls that we need to understand. Uh, cognitive thought, lack of concentration. Uh, um, Amanda, we have a question? We have, a, we have a couple of questions and they're related, so I wanted to tie, okay, sort of tie them do. together for you. Okay. Uh, the, the first one is, how do you suggest finding boundaries on communication with loved ones? Not too much information and not too little. My wife is great and I want to do better. Thank you. You know, and, and that's a great question because, and, and that's where it comes to that be direct. Hey, so you know what? I, I'd love to talk to you about my job. What parts would you like to understand? What parts would you want me to express to you? Uh, what about my emotions? What emotions would you like me? I mean, you probably see them. So maybe there has to be some type of communications between you both saying, hey, uh, uh, you know, the, the spouse saying, hey, I've seen now that uh, you've become more isolated. You're not doing dealing and doing uh, you know anything with the kids lately. Is there something going on at work? Did something happen at work? Why do you feel that you're starting to isolate? And just opening up, being direct. You know, we have a workshop just for spouses and partners, and it is amazing how strong they are and how they want to stand by their loved ones. So opening up, having that conversation, being direct, saying, you know what, there are times that I struggle. And if I'm acting a certain way, maybe you can come up with a common word that your loved one can say that will trigger to you to say, hey, maybe we need to discuss this. But please open up to them, let them know, hey, I, I, maybe you don't want to know everything. And maybe that's why I have a counselor, a chaplain, or a, a, a system team, or a peer support team member that I can go to. But don't underestimate the strength of our loved ones and how they want to be there for you as a support system at home. I think that um, the, the feedback that we're getting, I've gotten three text messages and there's also a comment here that your comments about uh, EMS being task oriented are a hundred percent spot on. And that is really connecting with a bunch of people, uh, the task orientation and the lack of a need to triage situations in home life. So right. I just wanted to pass along that that was uh, connecting with a lot of folks. I appreciate it. And this is one last question at, while we're at the midpoint here. We will be sharing a recording of this session uh, to the AAA website and social media as well as in our digest. And we'd love for uh, Firefighters Behavioral Health Alliance to do so as well. Um, we've had a few folks ask if we're allowed to distribute the actual slide deck. Is that something that you'd like to keep confidential or is that something that we should share as well? Yeah, that's uh, something we keep uh, just due to copyright uh, infringements. And uh, now I don't mind when we get to the data, I don't mind if you share that. And if you want to email me afterwards, I can send you the, the data as well. So I have no problem with that. And, uh, and maybe Amanda, you can put in the chat room, my email address of jdill at ffbha.org. Absolutely. Thank you so much for clarifying. We had about 10 people asking that. Everybody loves the deck, but they're going to love the recording too. So thanks, Jeff. Right. And uh, that was our last question right now. Okay, thanks. So um, and like I said, these were just some of the issues that these uh, members were, were dealing with. Uh, depression, yeah. 
there's major depression, there's dysthemia, bipolar. Uh, do we have people that we work with that are struggling with bipolar? Absolutely. What's ever out in America is within our EMS services. Uh, signs and symptoms of those that were struggling with depression, and you can see you, you probably uh, know a lot through your, your classes of what people uh, struggling with depression can look like, and it's different for everyone. Uh, one, there might be one sign, there might be uh, a plethora of signs. Uh, and this is from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, you can see uh, the way that they f the brain is firing on those that are not depressed, but those that are depressed, not a lot of activity in the brain. So it's a, it, it is a true issue that we need to deal with within ourselves if we feel that depression, you, you can't handle it on your own. I can tell you that much right now. We just can't. Uh, addiction, 17.4% of those uh, responded said that they struggle with addictions on a daily basis. And what do you think was number one? Well, you probably guessed it, alcohol. And why not? Alcohol is our easiest access. When we're struggling after that call, you know, maybe we had the SIDS patient or, you know, just a real bad uh, vehicle accident, or maybe we're dealing with administration and that's just causing us a lot of angst. Well, alcohol is our easiest access because remember, we were always told, handle things on your own. And it's real easy. Hey, I'm not sleeping well. I got these nightmares. Uh, you know, I'm struggling with the relationship issues. Maybe I'm having depression. I'll just run down to the, the liquor store and pick up a six pack or whatever your choice is. And uh, you know what? I'm off tomorrow. So hey, you, know, you have a six pack or whatever it is. And hey, I didn't sleep so bad. My, my stress and anxiety wasn't so bad about my relationship. And now I'm on, uh, you know, tomorrow, so I can't touch the stuff. But now I'm off again for days. I'll run down the liquor store and I didn't sleep so bad. And the, Stress and anxiety wasn't so bad or whatever you're dealing with. And before you know it, you're hooked. It's that easy. It doesn't make us bad people. Just remember, we were always told, handle things on your own. Don't bother administration. Don't bother others. Don't look weak. And alcohol was our first choice. Uh, what do you think our second choice, or our second amongst our survey is for addictions? I'll give you a second to think about it. I'll play the Jeopardy theme. No. But number two was gambling. And why gambling? Well, what does gambling feed? Gambling feeds that adrenaline rush. And every time those tones go off and you respond and you hear some bad call, what happens to you in your body? Your blood pressure, your heart rate, all those things go up. And when you start doing this job for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, whatever, you, how long you've been in, guess what? Your body looks for that. You know, and, and it looks for that adrenaline rush and it becomes addictions. And, and the top five were smoking, eating, uh, pornography. I was surprised my addiction wasn't on there. Mine, frosted flakes. Oh my gosh. Uh, ever since I was little, I would eat three or four bowls of frosted flakes every day. And when I got to the firehouse and they, my, you know, my crew saw that I was putting sugar on them. Oh my gosh. Uh, it's, it, it is amazing. Your body starts looking for it. I can feel it at night before I go to bed. It's saying, I need that frosted flakes. I need that bowl. I, I have cut down to just one bowl a day, so I'm, I'm doing well that way. But it's amazing what our body and our minds look for to feed off you know, and the, the stress that we're dealing with, uh, whatever it is, you know, PTSD, sleep. Uh, so how do you get help, of course, uh, uh, counseling, inpatient treatment? This is important. If your organization, to find inpatient organ, uh, organizations that have uh, counselors and programs that deal with uh, EMS personnel. And if you need help with that, just let me know. I will, I will help you with that. I only refer to about four or five different places. Not because we get money. We don't. I don't believe in kickbacks and referral fees and things like that. Don't do that. It's because I've been there. I've been to those places, I've seen them, I've asked, I asked the administration the tough questions that when I send a brother or sister here, what's going to happen? So if you need help with that, let me know. Uh, one of the other things uh, is know your insurance. What will my insurance pay for? When we started referring people to different places, we found out that their insurances really didn't cover all that they were supposed to. And, uh, you know, the EMS personnel were coming back saying, yeah, Jeff, I feel a lot better. Thank you. But unfortunately, I got saddled with a five, $10,000 bill. And how much stress does that add to, you know, your, your livelihood and your family? So these are the things that we need to watch out for.
Uh, alcoholism, once again, Mayo Clinic, as you can see, uh, the one on the right, the alcohol is just eating away at the brain cells. It, uh, it does take a, a, an effect on your body. There's no doubt about that. Um, let's quick talk about PTS. <laughs> Very, very difficult. Where was it always known? Well, you know, it was always in the military. Military. Then all of a sudden it became police. And now we need to talk about it for EMS and fire and dispatchers. Uh, I changed everything around in all our workshops. Why? Because I started getting a lot of calls from EMS and firefighters saying, Jeff, I, I went and got help. I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress and I was taken off the job. And uh, that, that's very sad when you get those calls because they're looking for the help and yet their organization said, oh, sorry, <laughs> we can't do anything about it. Now you can't do the job. And then they were done. So you add that into the PTS diagnosis and it becomes a real problem for our, our brothers and sisters. But I changed everything around because I don't want you to be afraid of four little letters, post-traumatic stress disorder. And yes, I believe in post-traumatic stress injury. It's just that the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, which counselors use, is the, you know, the, the go-to. And it, it talks about you know, what are the, the diagnosis criteria. So we're going to go over the criteria because I want you to understand what it is. I want you to understand how maybe you're struggling and how it might apply. These are what the categories, these are what the criteria are when a counselor, you, know, you go see a counselor. Criteria one, the, the person was exposed to death, threat, and actual or threatened serious injury, meaning did you have direct exposure? Well, guess what? Welcome to our world, right? Sometimes on a daily basis. They will also look for, did you witness a trauma? I cannot tell you the amount of EMS and firefighters I've spoken to that were at the Las Vegas shooting all across the United States. And they said, man, we thought there was four or five shooters. People were flying all over the place, the bullets, the blood. It, it, that Witnessing that trauma is absolutely incredible. Or maybe witnessing the trauma when you were young. Maybe you were abused. And so these are things that they will look for when required. Another one is learning that a relative or close friend was exposed to a trauma or indirect exposure. Are you going home and telling your loved ones every detail that maybe they have secondary, by, secondary or vicarious trauma? Where I really see this indirect exposure come into play, and that's our dispatchers. And they hear the calls, but they don't see them. And how good are our minds at starting to create things as we go along, you know, when you don't see things? So they'll look at the counselors, will look at this, and one is required. Criteria B, one's required. The traumatic event is persistently re-experienced in the following ways. Intrusive thoughts, nightmares, flashbacks. So what's the difference between intrusive thoughts and flashbacks? I get this question a lot. Intrusive thoughts. My wife says, honey, I'm, I'm going to make you pasta tonight for dinner. I love pasta. She says, but one caveat, you have to go to the store and buy the ingredients. So great, okay. So I got my list and I'm going down shopping. Oh, we're having noodles. I can pick up the uh, you know, bow tie noodles for tonight. All right. As I reach for the box, boom, an image of a child drowning appears out of nowhere. And it shakes me to my core. And so I shake it off and I start going down and I'm looking for the, the gravy, the, the, the sauce. And as I reach for the sauce, boom, the family standing over. Don't let him die. Don't let our son die. Those are intrusive thoughts. They come out of nowhere. You're not thinking about it at all. I know some of our EMS and firefighter brothers and sisters that have 12 to 18 of these a day. They, they can't drive because when it hits them, they just they go catatonic. They're in counseling. So that's an intrusive thought. It comes out of nowhere. You're not even thinking about it. Whereas flashbacks are you get in the box, the ambulance, and you're going to the store. And as you drive down the road, you say, hey, wasn't that that house where those two kids, uh, they were uh, physically abused and we had to take care of them? And oh, my God, that was awful. And then you get down to the stop sign and you say, hey, wasn't this the stop sign where that truck ran that stop sign and, and hit that motorcycle with those two people on it? Yeah, that's it. I, I can't look at a Kawasaki without thinking about that call. That's a flashback, something you see that triggers those memories. Two different things, two very difficult issues to handle on your own. In fact, you can't. You need to get help on these issues. And, of course, nightmares, that's self-explanatory. You're going to bed doing your Sudoku, and an hour and a half later, you're up. You're either screaming, crying, fetal position, shaking, you know, whatever it is. 
So those are you know, the differences. And uh, maybe an emotional distress after an exposure, or traumatic reminder, or physical reactivity. You know, maybe you, you just, something physical, you, you, you go on a call and you're just starting to throw up, you get severe headaches, whatever physical reactivity uh, to an exposure. So one's required out of that. Criteria C, one's required here. Avoidance, trauma-related stimuli, meaning trauma-related thoughts or feelings. Hey, I'm not thinking about this. I'm not talking about this. Or how about trauma-related reminders? This is, a, this is a difficult one, and I hope you'll take heed on this because I've spoken to uh, chiefs at the Sandy Hook Fire Department in regard to the, the shooting at school. Uh, how about uh, Sandy Hook School? I've spoken to the chief of the Aurora Theater shooting. I've spoken to chiefs at Umpqua Valley up in Oregon. I've been to their memorial site. I've spoken to a good friend of mine, Angel Leith, who runs the uh, peer support team for Las Vegas Fire. In our conversations, the one consistent was anniversaries. Anniversaries were very difficult. So please take notice that you know, if you're a supervisor, if you're a member, whatever it is, if your department has experience, and it doesn't have to be some big nationwide, some, you know, some issue, maybe you had a double drowning in a quarry or something, and you were the EMS personnel, write it down on your calendar, and then talk to people three month, six month, nine month, one year, hey, you know, it's been nine months since we had that double drowning. How's everyone doing? You know, Make sure you, you remember that anniversaries are very difficult for, for people. So one's required there. Two are required of this, negative thoughts, feelings that began, meaning inability to recall key features of trauma. I love what I do. It's very difficult what I do. I'm surrounded by death on a daily basis, but I will tell you, I enjoy what I do because I meet some fabulous EMS and firefighters across the United States. In, in one such case, uh, I met uh, a person who had just gotten back from a vehicle accident. Four family members were killed. And when they sat around the table, one of the firefighters asked this person and said, hey, uh, you know, you did, you did a great job of, you know, doing extrication and helping with patient care and things. And, and the firefighter said, I did what? He could not remember that call two hours later. It is amazing what our brains will do to protect ourselves. And so that's why we, we need to remember and understand these type of issues. Uh, have we become negative people? <laughs> what do you think? You know, absolutely we have. Um, ask your loved ones if you think that they become negative. So, you know, two are required of these, exaggerated blame or guilt. Where we see this a lot is due to guilt. Guilt, uh, we find uh, officers that were on a scene that lost someone, um, maybe an ambulance driver that was involved in an accident, which might have been or might not have been their fault, and their, you know, their uh, partner died. They carry that guilt. And uh, we have several suicide letters that explain that guilt. So watch out for that. It's very powerful. Uh, negative effect, uh, decreased interest in activities, isolated and difficult experience, positive effects. So two are required out of those. Criteria E, trauma-related arousal reactivity, meaning uh, have you started showing a lot more anger? How about uh, riskier destructive behavior? Um, Hypervigilance, meaning your head's on a swivel. You're always looking, you're always thinking about what's going to happen next. Uh, startled reaction, loud noises, large crowds. Have you become more of an introvert than you know, the way that you used to be, where you used to like to go out to concerts and, and large groups? So these are difficulty concentrating, of course, difficulty sleeping. So these are required as well. Uh, symptoms last for more than one month. That uh, symptoms create distress or functional impairment, meaning social, meaning you, you just don't like to go out to, in, in the society anymore, or occupational, meaning it's tough for you to get the job. Please take heed of this. What we have noticed is a late sign for our brothers and sisters taking their lives uh, when they start calling in sick from work. If you start seeing one of your members start doing this, you need to pounce on that like a, a pit bull on a poodle. You've got to be proactive with that. So that's a late sign that we've seen in our data collecting. And then of course, uh, criteria, symptoms are not due to medication, substance abuse, or others. Uh, 
Uh, the treatments that are out there are uh, CBT and, of course, ENDR. And that's why it's important uh, if you call American Ambulance Association or you call us and say, hey, I need some counselor, I'm having some trauma issues, uh, some calls, or maybe it's something in your past. I will look for a counselor that is EMDR uh, certified. It's just a way of moving the eyes, uh, processing, um, listening to music, lights and things. I'm not EMDR certified. It takes about two months and, I, and I'm gone all the time. But uh, these are the things that we need to look for and resources for our brothers and sisters. Amanda? So we've gotten a, a couple of different questions. Um, okay. What, one person wanted to know if you believe that there is indirect exposure to trauma for, by medical billers or other uh, similar professions as well, since they often have to read about the calls after they are completed. No, oh, absolutely, and, and that and that falls into that uh, that indirect, like a a dispatcher. They're they're seeing it, they're reading it, and you know I I haven't seen fourteen hundred sixty five suicides, but I'm listening to it and and I'm hearing it. So a absolutely, I believe uh, that is a, a a condition of the job that we need to watch out for. Thank you so much for that, and for anyone listening or for the person that asked that question. Our counselor matching program and our CISM program both cover other kinds of occupations within the EMS world. So please don't hesitate to reach out or to encourage anyone who may be secondarily impacted to, to seek help, whether it's through your company's EAP or through the AAA resources. Um, and then we received another comment that your notes or thoughts about recognizing anniversaries really resonated. Um, an agency near one of the participants had a line of duty death nearly two years ago, and many people were afraid of the anniversary. They were having emotional reactions to the anniversary, um, and that recognizing the, that anniversary was helpful in processing their grief. No, absolutely, and it goes, it goes back to that being direct. Hey, you know what? I want to remember my brother or my sister. Um, whether it was either a line of duty death or a suicide or maybe just you know, they fell prey to a vehicle accident, but being direct and recognizing, hey, this means a lot to healing process for so many is to remember them. So kudos to them. Thank you so much. That was our last question for now. Okay. Uh, we're running low on time, so I'll probably, uh, I'll skip this next session, uh, the next section where uh, this is my granddaughter. It turns out my granddaughter, she uh, lost her right eye to cancer in 2011, uh, retinoblastoma. And uh, I, I will tell you that uh, I struggled deeply with it uh, because um, you know, I just felt that being in the fire service, I should have done something. I should have seen the warning signs of retinoblastoma. And uh, you know, it's that mentality, that thought belief. How, how, how would you? How would you know anything about it? Uh, but I, I do, I always like to talk about the, the public service announcement of this, that retinoblastoma and it affects children zero to seven years old, and it can be in one eye or both eyes, and the sign to really watch out for it is that when you take a picture and you get red eye, you usually get red eye in the eyes. For, uh, for Lily, it was red in the left and white in the right, and it was the flash bouncing off the tumor. And we went back eight months and could see that. And so that's why I talk about this, uh, you know, my, my personal, but due to time constraints, I won't. I will tell you, though, uh, that uh, this is her today. She's uh, 10 years old. She rides horses, and she's a, she's a, she's a champion at it. So we all have our uh, things that uh, happen, and yet we can overcome them. And, of course, these are her siblings, my, my other grandkids. Uh, but we, like I said, we have validated 1,511 of these tragic events. And EMS, we have only validated 237. And, uh, and, and I know uh, Anne-Marie very well from Code Green, uh, organization that started in 2016. And uh, we work together to try to uh, make sure that we remember all our brothers and sisters in the EMS. And if you're out there and uh, you uh, know of someone in the EMS organization that has uh, uh, killed themselves, and, and I'm very direct. Uh, they died by suicide, killed themselves. It's not committed. Uh, 
that uh, please fill out the confidential report so that we can remember them as well as uh, hopefully take care of their family members, which is, like I said, so very important to us. We estimate about a 65% reporting to FBHA. Where we feel we miss out a lot is on the EMS side as well as the volunteer fire. These are the methods of suicide that have come into FBHA of our brothers and sisters. I mean, they're all horrific. There's no doubt about it. But I show this, and I know it's difficult, but I show it because some of these are how much pain were they in that they tortured themselves in some aspect. And I look at, like, dynamite. You know, we had one brother who held a, a stick of dynamite in his mouth. And this one actually bothered me the most because uh, for about four or five days, I just imagined uh, this, this brother watching that wick burn down. And I'm thinking, all you have to do is take that stick of dynamite and throw it away. But uh, to struggle with that decision and watch that is, is amazing. Uh, you know, and I, and I just don't, amazing in a very uh, sad way. Uh, immolation, uh, that is uh, setting yourself on fire. We've had six of our brothers and sisters take their lives. Uh, seppuku, which is an ancient Japanese ritual. We had a, a, a brother struggling with uh, uh, a divorce and stuff, called his wife in the bedroom, took that sword and it opened himself up in front of her. Uh, easy exit. Maybe this might be something that you've seen. Uh, this is a plastic bag around their head with a tube connected to helium. And helium in its natural state will put you out instantly. And with that bag over their head, they just suffocate while they're sleeping. And, and, and what about a flare gun? I've had one of our brothers stick a flare gun down their throat. He died a day and a half later. So there's a lot of pain out there amongst our brothers and sisters, both in the fire and EMS and dispatch world. And so please, you know, be, be direct. You know, do that internal size up. Walk the walk with a brother or sister that might be struggling as well. Uh, as you can see, suicide methods, uh, 876 by firearm, uh, 231 by hanging, 169 is unknown. You know, our data, like I said, there's so much to it. There's no discrimination. It doesn't care if you're EMS, fire, dispatch. It doesn't care if you're a volunteer, career, city, suburban, rural, male, female, ages, ranks, one thing that really uh, stands out when we look at methods, uh, in society, uh, for males, firearms is the number one method. For females in society, it's overdose. But when we look at our data, the number one method for suicide, both male and female, is our firearms. And, uh, and I don't know. I mean, I, I make assumptions based on the data. Is that I think for females, is it because they've been on those calls and they see their 99.999% accurate and effective you know, getting the job done for that person struggling or is it because you fall prey to the culture of how you're supposed to act when you put this uniform on uh, and in in the fire service especially it's a male dominant career uh, and so do they not only have to work that way and live up to expectations that they also die that way so i i don't know it's, like I said, this is what we learned from looking at our data. Uh, suicide by years, 65%. I, I can tell you that uh, we're missing out a lot of brothers and sisters. Uh, for 2020, you see 48 there. That's, uh, I believe, 35 uh, firefighters and 13 EMS. Are there more? Absolutely there are. And, but one thing I want you to know, when you see our, our data and our numbers and articles and magazines, these are not numbers. These are the faces and names of our brothers and sisters and the families they left behind. That is something I don't want you to ever forget, please. You know, our top five warning signs. I interviewed over 500 of our uh, EMS and firefighter brothers and sisters across the United States. And uh, the, these were people that were struggling with uh, suicidal ideations, depression, and PTSD. And uh, I always say, think rails. There's no particular order. Uh, recklessness and impulsiveness. You know, they, they became more reckless in their personal lives, impulsive and decision-making. Uh, very difficult to do when you're struggling with emotions. We do that cognitive uh, um, disconnect. We start making decisions based on our emotions. Uh, anger, displacement, um, where we start taking things home uh, to our family members. Uh, isolation. This was one I struggled with with my granddaughter. But I also believe it's the easiest one to see when they're just not participating around the, uh, you know, the station, the training uh, for volunteer departments, when they're not showing up on calls or maybe participating in fundraising uh, 
about. So isolation is uh, very difficult. How about loss of confidence and skills and abilities? This one surprised me. These were uh, EMS members that um, they couldn't remember drug dosages. They couldn't remember guidelines and policies. And it weren't, thank God they said we had the book with us, you know, our hospital book. But one story I'll never forget was a, a, a paramedic uh, on the job for 14 years. And in tears, he's telling me, he said, I was struggling with an issue with one of my children having a, a health issue. And uh, we went on a call and I asked the junior medic to take care of it. It was a minor call. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll drive to the hospital. The hospital was four miles away. Been on that job that many years. When he got into the cab, he said, I couldn't remember how to get to the hospital. He said the frustration, the panic it was just overwhelming. And, and this is what happens when we start dealing with our personal and our professional lives and they start mixing together. And then, of course, sleep deprivation. You know, how many of us have sleep issues? Mine came into effect just last night. I didn't get to bed till 4 a.m. in the morning. I tried to go to bed at 11.30. And uh, I did sleep, though, from 4 to 10. So that's good. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we see a lot of different things, uh, uh, especially loss or sense of humor. Where we started seeing loss of sense of humor, that was in our retirees. You know, so what is our humor? Well, it's a coping skill. And uh, when we're dealing with issues, it's a coping skill. And so when you retire, or maybe you just resign or you're injured, fired, how does that play effect if you've never talked to a loved one at home about things that you deal with? And now they sit around and, and they struggle. All right, let's see. Oops, seem to be locked up here. There we go. Uh, one thing I, I really emphasize is learning how to listen. This is key, and it's difficult for us to do, but listen to what your brothers and sisters are saying on the job. Listen for that, that key point that maybe there's a word that they're struggling with, and then be direct and challenge with compassion. Allow them to talk. Don't jump in with responses. Let them speak from their heart. And, you know, avoid those perfect solutions and, and options. You just don't have them. Uh, you know, watch out for body language. That's important. But another thing is that listening skill is also to listen to others when they approach you. Just don't put it off. Like I said, people see us better than we will ever see ourselves. Action plan advice for your department, you know, confidentiality. We, we must understand what confidentiality is. It's a number one killer of peer support teams, SISM teams, uh, EAP, employee assistant programs, uh, talking to officers. If they spread things out, it's absolutely, uh, it's very traumatic for that person involved. So understand what confidentiality is. When people always come to me and say, uh, Jeff, if someone comes to me and says, can we talk and can you keep this between us? What's, what's my response? I tell them, your response is, I can keep it confidential as long as you understand I'm a mandated reporter. You tell me anything about homicide, suicide, illegal acts, elderly abuse, child abuse, I have to upgrade it per our guidelines and policies. And then people say, well, if they walk away, what am I supposed to do? How much? You can't tackle them and say, hey, what would what, you want to say? So, but understand that confidentiality is key. Uh, once again, talk, 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 please. Educate yourself. Keep on attending seminars, workshops. Understand what behavioral health is and how it applies to you and your organization. Have to have buy-in from the top. Absolutely. I cannot tell you the amount of workshops that I've been to where they said, Jeff, great workshop. I just wish our, our senior officers would attend. What type of message does that send to your members of your organization if your senior members don't want to learn about behavioral health? So the, those are difficult challenges. You know, find out about employee assistant, your clinicians, chaplains in your area. These are all important things. Develop a peer support or a SISM team. Uh, you know, American Ambulance Association has a SISM team. Uh, they send as a resource to departments that have experienced some type of traumatic event. Amanda? I think the, the deck sharing has actually um, lagged a little bit behind okay. what you're talking about. It might be that it's just frozen somehow. So if it's easier, I could switch to being the sharer or please do. stop sharing and then restart. Yeah, please do. Perfect. Okay, so if you hit stop I sharing, did. then I'll switch to sharing. There we go. Hey. Thank you, everybody. You know, how, you know how technology is, particularly when everybody's on the internet. Mm-hmm.
So what, there we are. Is this the right slide? Uh, if you go back one, I think. Uh, no, we have to go back a, a couple because I want to um, uh, rate. Uh, you, uh, go forward, please. Keep on going. A, a little bit farther. And uh, so those two right here. So develop a peer support or assistant team is, is absolutely, absolutely critical. If you have a peer support team, and we've consulted with numerous uh, EMS and fire departments across the United States on creating a behavioral health program. For us, it's, it's 12 different points. If you want more information on that, if you want templates on how to create behavioral health programs, guidelines, and policies, send me an email. I'll send them to you. But for peer support teams and system teams, it is crucial. And they're written now in San Diego, Las Vegas, other different places we've been, that if you're on a team, Twice a year, you're mandated to go see a counselor because that's the problem. We always want to help out our brothers and sisters. We forget about ourselves. So if you're on a peer support team or a SISM team, please put that in your guidelines and policies that members must twice a year go seek out some type of counseling. And uh, for developing a behavioral health program, send me an email and I'll, I'll send you some information and templates. And uh, we'll look at the next slide, which is our stats. Ages, once again, not a lot of discrimination. Our youngest was a 17-year-old volunteer firefighter. Our oldest was a 97-year-old uh, retired firefighter. And uh, so you, you're not, not a lot of discrimination amongst the ages that we collect. And then the next slide will show those that were uh, active versus retired. As you can see, as difficult it is to get active, it's more difficult to get retirees. But out of the 261 retirees, 37 of them took their lives within the first five days of retirement. We have to do a lot better within our organizations. Take a look at your own organization. What are, you, what are they doing to help your members prepare for retirement? What about if they were disabled or re resigned, suspended? What are we doing? Can we offer some type of counseling benefits? Can we offer chaplain visits? Um, you know, these are all issues that we need to discuss. And that's why we created saying goodbye, the emotional detachment. It's you know, how do we help organizations prepare their members for retirement? So once again, not a lot of discrimination. And then uh, next slide, please. And then, of course, the emotional aspects. We interviewed over 125 recently retired EMS and firefighters, and we found out the, the big three were, um, you, can, you can show them, okay, Amanda, were loss of identity, lack of belonging, and lack of purpose. These are big issues, and uh, especially that lack of purpose. Most of us uh, retiring in our early 50s. If, if not younger, and sometimes volunteers, if not older. But that lack of purpose is very important. And uh, I always tell people, if we go to the next slide, we have to understand, what do I stand for? We need to look into the mirror and ask ourselves, as, as I come close to resigning or retiring, whatever it is, you have to figure out, what do I stand for? And you look into your eyes, and it's amazing how you see your life pass in front of you. And what you want to do with all that information, all those experiences, it's like Maslow's Pyramid, the self-actualization, the top, where you pass on that information, you, you pass on that help to others. And, and that gives you purpose. But we need to start doing that uh, of, uh, about a year and a half before we retire. So as we uh, move on to the next slide, um, and that is resources. What does your, you know, your organization have? What do you use? Uh, I love that American Angels uh, Association uh, has um, contacted us so that we can help out my brothers and sisters in EMS by pairing them up with counselors, maybe even some chaplains. We've referred some chaplains to people. You know, it, it's absolutely important. Uh, uh, 741 741 that's a text if you text them and put in their badge they'll know that there it's an ems uh, first responder that needs some help and uh, you can text message back and forth people uh, the national volunteer fire council down there at the bottom uh, that if you want to take a snapshot of that or i can send you the link if you send it to me that is our list of 170 counselors that we have validated and uh, it's important to have for your organization, for your members. So our final slide. In summary, learn how to listen. Please challenge with compassion, be direct, figure out what do you stand for and how you want to pass on uh, 
please don't bury what burdens you. It will come out in some aspect sometime in your life. So don't bury what burdens you. And the last one, of course, is, you know, please do that internal size up. Ask yourself, why am I acting this way? Why am I feeling this way? Don't hesitate to call uh, American Ambulance Association that, and, or us so that we can get you help. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jeff. This is just an exceptional collection of statistics and information and all of the comments that we've gotten, some public, some private, have uh, been so positive about everything that you've shared with us today. Um, I don't see that we've had any last questions come in, um, but I just wanted to take a moment to echo your request that um, everyone on this call and everyone in their networks, please don't hesitate to reach out to the AAA or to the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance. What we do if you visit our ambulance.org slash support for medics site is give you the options to fill out a short form that actually goes to your staff, not our staff, goes to your staff to make meaningful connections with an EMS competent counselor in your area. Similarly, ambulance.org slash CISM is where we can connect you with a, a CISM team that would come to your service if uh, God forbid something, a, a traumatic incident impacts many of your staff. So we at the American Ambulance Association are so deeply proud of our partnership with you and we're so honored to have you here today. Um, truly appreciate your time. And I think you can see in the comments, everyone's just thanking you for your time and your insights. So well, thank I you again, it. Jeff, and we hope to have you back. Well, thank you. And, uh, and like I said, um, you know, this is the message that from our brothers and sisters that are struggling or have, uh, you know, taken their lives. And I'm just trying to pass that on so that you will see something in your life or maybe someone you work with and uh, be direct with them and, and be direct with yourself to, to get that help. Thanks again, Jeff, and wishing everyone an absolutely wonderful weekend. And as always, please don't hesitate to reach out. Take care, everyone. And have Goodbye, a everyone. Have a great weekend.